Okay, we're ready to start working on some proofs. This proof comes from Lesson Practice 26A in your student workbook. I believe it's on page 305. If you don't have your student workbook with you, you might want to pause this video right now and go ahead and get your workbook along with some colored pencils or pens. If you look at the directions for this proof, and actually they're going to apply to all of the proofs in uh, this week's lessons, um, you are asked to complete the following proofs using the hypotenuse leg, leg leg, hypotenuse angle, or leg angle postulates. We just talked about how these postulates refer specifically to right triangles. You cannot use them unless you have a right triangle. So it's very important when you're doing these proofs that before you cite one of these postulates as a reason, you show first of all that you are indeed working with right triangles. So I see uh, hypotenuse leg cited as a reason in this proof. That means that somewhere in these prior steps, it has already been established that we are working with right triangles. As always, we're going to go ahead and start um, by looking at our given statements. So, we are given that triangle ABD is isosceles with long side BD. What are all of the implications of ABD being an isosceles triangle? Well, hopefully you remember the definition of an isosceles triangle from earlier in the year. An isosceles triangle is a triangle that has two congruent sides. So when in this statement they're saying that uh, BD is the long side, they're trying to differentiate side BD from the two congruent sides. So if BD is the long side, it must mean that AB is congruent to AD. Another implication of having an isosceles triangle is that the base angles of an isosceles triangle are congruent. So it's really important to think through all of the implications of your given information and make a note of them on the drawing. Now it might um, happen that as we go further along in the proof, we may not need all of the information that we've identified, but it's good to have it there for us to see so we know um, what, what statements we can make about the triangle. The other given statement that we have is that line segment AC is perpendicular to line segment BD. AC is perpendicular to BD, so it follows that these must be right angles since perpendicular lines form right angles. Uh, we talked about how our given statements always provide us with a starting place for our proof and then how our proof statement is the stopping place for our proof. And it's going to be the very last statement in our proof. Now sometimes it's good to really just analyze this um, what, what we are being asked to prove because it's going to give us an idea of the approach that we need to take. So we are asked to show that C is the midpoint of BD. Let's see if I can mark this with a pen. We want to show that C is the midpoint of BD. Well, what would the implications of this be? If C is the midpoint of this line segment, then that would mean that BC is congruent 
to DC. Now we haven't shown that yet. We haven't been given this information that BC is congruent to DC, um, but we're just saying we need to show this. If, if, we need, if we are going to show that C is the midpoint of BD, then this is going to be something else we're going to have to show. Now, how could we show that BC is congruent to DC? Well, if I look at this diagram, I realize that BC is actually part of another triangle. Okay, so I'm gonna take away these red marks here because remember, we haven't shown this yet. We haven't been given the fact that these line segments are congruent, but that's what we would have to prove in order to show that C is the midpoint. So once again, I'm going back and I'm highlighting these two triangles, okay? I'm going to highlight triangle ABC in yellow and we'll do triangle ADC in blue or turquoise. Okay, and once again, we're looking at BC and line segment DC because we need to show that they're congruent. Well, they're each, they're each a leg of a triangle. So if we could show that these two smaller triangles are congruent, then by corresponding parts of corresponding, or corresponding parts of congruent triangles, we could show that BC and DC are congruent. So if we look at the implications of this proof statement, if we need to prove that C is the midpoint of BD, we need to show that BC is congruent to DC. And in order to do that, we must show that triangle ACB is congruent to triangle ADC. So this kind of gives us um, an outline of what we need to do in this proof. So let's go ahead and start filling in our statements and our reasons. Okay, the first statement is a given statement and we have two given statements over here. Which one are we going to choose from? Well, if I look at the statements that follow immediately after this first given statement, I see that they make reference to right angles. So I know that these statements must have followed this given statement that AC is perpendicular to BD because perpendicular lines form right angles. So sometimes we're going to find ourselves uh, looking ahead to give us direction as to what to fill in. Okay, now we can say, given that we have perpendicular lines, these next two statements follow directly from this fact. So a, angle ACB is a right angle by definition of perpendicular. And we can also say that ACD is a right angle by definition of perpendicular. Okay, now we have another given statement that's cited. So it must be this, that triangle ABD is isosceles. and that was given as well. Now, what follows directly from this definition of isosceles? Well, we found two facts that immediately follow from the fact that this triangle is isosceles. We said that 
that implies that AB is congruent to AD and angle B is congruent to angle D. So there are two implications of triangle ABD being isosceles. But, but here we only have one implication cited. So which one are we going to use? Once again, we're going to have to look ahead and we see that they're using the hypotenuse leg postulate. So what we're looking for is we're looking for the hypotenuses to be congruent and then another leg to be congruent. The hypotenuse leg postulate does not make use of any congruent angles. So uh, this notation, these markings right here are irrelevant to this proof given the approach that the author has taken. Now you could have gone a different way. You could have gone uh, the hypotenuse angle route to show that these two triangles are congruent and then you would use these angles. But because the author has chosen to go the route of hypotenuse leg, we won't use this information but we will use the fact that line segment AB is congruent to line segment AD. Okay, now we're going for a hypotenuse leg. We need to find some legs that are congruent. Okay, well, there are two legs, here and here, here and here. Now I'm looking at this leg right here. These two smaller triangles share a leg they share the leg AC. So when I look at this reflexive property, that tells me we're gonna focus on this leg right here and we're going to say AC is congruent to AC. The reflexive property says that a thing is congruent to itself. Now let's stop right here and, and just look at where we've come from. If I look, at these uh, first three lines in our proof, the whole purpose of these lines was to show that we have right triangles. And that's important because in order to invoke one of these postulates as a reason, we need to verify that we've been working with right triangles. Okay, if I look at this statement right here, statement five, I've shown that the hypotenuses of the two triangles are congruent, and now I've just shown in this last step that the legs of these two smaller triangles are congruent. So I've shown that we have right triangles and I've shown that their hypotenuses are congruent and they have um, a leg in each of the triangles that's congruent. Okay, so now we can cite our hypotenuse leg postulate and we can say that triangle ACB is congruent to triangle ACD by the hypotenuse leg postulate. Now that we've shown that these two triangles are congruent, I can say that this leg must also be congruent to this leg by corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So BC right here is congruent to DC by CPCTC. Finally, because I know that these two line segments are congruent to each other, I know that by definition, C must be the midpoint.
the midpoint of line segment BD by definition of midpoint. Because a midpoint will divide a line segment into two congruent pieces, and that's what we've shown right here.